Uh, so what we're going to mostly emphasize uh, in this story map are the connections associated with the Mammoth Cave area. The connections between uh, living and non-living material on the surface and the subsurface, the connection and relationship that humans have had with the cave area over thousands of years, and the connection uh, that we have currently with uh, the cave area and the, and the cave system. Um, and these connections are important, in particular, if we are going to, in the future and currently manage uh, the cave ecosystems um, in order to maintain the uh, healthy and vibrant cave communities uh, in perpetuity. Um, and of course, uh, as you've seen with many of the wonderful presentations today, we start with water and rock. And I'll turn it over uh, to Rick to me in a moment. You'll be hearing from uh, all three of us today. Yes, um, as Kurt noted, the connections are a crucial thing. We're gonna be discussing connections uh, between the surface and subsurface ecosystems, things about the subsurface ecosystems and how they function. And we're also gonna be talking about um, key issues, stressors, and threats that we have to our, to, to, to the, resources here at Mammoth Cave and some of the routes that the park has used to deal with these. Obviously one of the key both issues and uh, key mechanisms for connection between the surface and subsurface uh, ecosystems is water. As karst drainage, the water flows uh, falling on the surface, moves quickly into the subsurface this map shows results of hundreds of dye traces to, uh, showing create or, or uh, helping us figure out the various basins that in the cave. Kurt is now showing the Turnhole Basin, one of our, the largest basin that feeds into the park. It's a basin that um, that drains something like 345 kilometer square kilometers. 88% of which is, out, are, is outside of the park. So that is another piece in this, as we look at how our um, response is to these issues, stressors and threats, is that some of our responses can be on a very local um, level, but others have to be on a more regional level because of these large drainage basins that we have. So uh, key, key threats include to water quality, include things like agricultural runoff, uh, storm ru water runoff from parking lots, roads, septic system issues. And we have significant threats coming from transportation corridors. And I, I, oh, before we go there, I should note, we didn't show you the dye tracing. The dye traces are the hundreds of dye traces that develop this map. Here's a nice example of uh, the uh, Center for Cave and Karst Studies and, uh, and the park working together on a uh, dye trace in, that was in the park. And now Rick Olson will chat a little bit more about some of our work along some of the, in dealing with threats from the transportation corridors. You want that now, Rick? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, Rick Olson here, park ecologist and, um, you know, cutting across the drainage that is outside the park but goes into the park, we have uh, uh, highways like Interstate 65 and uh, the railroad, uh, CSX Railroad. And um, so Kurt, can you show the planned 
Yeah. So <clears throat> years ago, you know, we, we've had some spills along I-65 that had some pretty serious consequences for life in Mammoth Cave. And um, we have to, we have to, we stand on the shoulders of car scientists up in Indiana who developed uh, retention filtration basins uh, outside of uh, a, a significant cave, Blue Spring Cave in Indiana. We realized that someday I-65 would have to be expanded. The, the level of traffic was just so much that it needed to be increased from two lanes to three lanes on each side. And so I invited or asked uh, folks from up there in Indiana come down and look at our situation and give us advice. And uh, so they said, you know what? Uh, keep it simple. And because uh, they put in stuff that was way too complicated to maintain. They said, just, just put in grassy swales. So we talked with the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet and they said, oh yeah, we could do that. We have to put in uh, silt uh, retention basins during construction. We can just make those permanent. So what you see here are these brown hashed areas. And these were originally designed just to retain uh, silt and sediment from during the construction. They said, well, we can just make those permanent. So they did. And uh, Kurt, if you'll go to the next picture. Okay, this is one of the retention basins along the interstate and you can see that there's a, uh, on the left there, there's a riprap uh, sort of dam. And so the, the idea is that water can filter through that and it'll gradually kind of fill it in. But these things are mowable. Um, and so if there's any soil piping or something like that, it's immediately obvious it can be repaired. And they're all designed to be at a minimum 10,000 gallons so that if an entire semi goes over and spills, it'll slow it down at least. It's not perfect. It's not, you know, it, it can still soak through the soil, but we have much better chance than we did in the past. And this is uh, uh, like an adjuvant to the uh, HAZMAP that Bryce Leach worked on years ago where they, and, and, and they, uh, the transportation cabinet still today has these maps so that if there is a spill, they have this, they have this map and they can know which way the water is gonna go or the spill is gonna go and therefore where, which side to put the berms on, the absorbent pads and so forth. So uh, this is something that we hope will be really helpful uh, to protect Mammoth Cave uh, in the future. Um, and then we hope <clears throat> that someday there will be such things as these uh, kind of uh, retention filtration basins along the CSX Railroad. Rick? Yeah. I'm going to step in and make one comment that during a uh, Mammoth Cave uh, Area Biosphere Reserve meeting, the then representative of the Transportation Cabinet uh, in discussing the uh, expansion project for I-65 said he was building a uh, erosion control structure with, 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 a high, with, with a couple of lanes of road through the middle of it. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what that means, but I hope it's good. Oh no, that was very good. They, that, that their primary thing was uh, protecting the, the karst from the siltation and everything. And they just happened to be put, paving some roads through the middle of their erosion control structure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So are we ready to talk about landscape ecology? Yes. Okay. So now I'm, I'm only seeing part of this diagram. I don't know if everybody else is, uh, I don't know if the participants are seeing the whole thing or not, but. I've got it all. Okay, so the key thing here is that you see along the top, forest, woodland, and barrens. Now, barrens are a local term for grasslands or prairie. And uh, these were actually created by, by people starting about 4,000 years ago. At any rate, 
They're green because of photosynthesis. This is the primary production area for the karst landscape. We do have a little bit of uh, uh, chemoautotrophy uh, from hydrogen sulfide, a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the area, but you know, for the most part, cave ecosystems are supported by, ultimately, by photosynthesis. photosynthesis. And so it, it, that's why the arrows go both to the cave aquatic ecosystem and the terrestrial ecosystem, and then ultimately to the river ecosystem. And you'll see that there's arrows going back from the river to both. And that's because the, the river back floods through springs up into the cave sometimes when the river goes up and from, from rainfall, heavy rainfall upstream. And that actually imports um, organic matter into the cave, which helps feed especially the base level cave aquatic community, but also it leaves a film of organic matter on the walls that actually when the waters recede is utilized by the cave uh, terrestrial ecosystem. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so looking at, again, at this landscape ecology, uh, I, as I mentioned, um, the Native Americans, uh, which they now call themselves Indians, even though they're not from India, uh, started burning. And they did this to improve grazing for hunting. Um, and the diversity of plant life as a result is just amazing. So we have a little teeny bit of the sinkhole plain. This is out on the sinkhole plain south of the park. And there were hundreds of square miles of uh, this, this stuff called barrens. Now it was actually a mosaic of grassland and, um, and, 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 and forest. Because um, you have place names like Walnut Hill indicating there was forest out there, but it was a patchwork. So uh, last year we were finally able to put fire on the Barrens. Uh, this is south of Diamond Caverns, and uh, the response to the fire has been fantastic. Um, the diversity of, of wildflowers and so forth and prairie grasses is just amazing. Nothing was planted here where you, you see the guys setting fire, the guys and gals, and um, this is all from the seed bank. So now on the left, you see a picture that I took in back in 1999 during a severe drought. And there's two things about this location. This is uh, uh, south and east of the park uh, where uh, 31W, passes a place called Dripping Spring. And there's a, still a church there that was established in 1831. Well, back in about 1804, there was actually a botanist named Francois Michaud who came through the area and uh, he was sent there by uh, 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 the president, Thomas Jefferson, because Thomas Jefferson was very curious about the uh, West. And this was the West back then. And he noted that what you see in the foreground was at that time, part of the barrens, a grassland. And then there was this escarpment, okay? And he noted that this escarpment was just barely, I mean, dotted with trees. Mostly it was just a uh, bare rock. And that's because he said the Indians burned it every year. And of course, this is a south facing slope so the fire would go right up it, it would be dry. And so we have these observations from very early on by a trained botanist, which is just absolutely amazing. The other thing about this is it shows the effect of hydrogeology on plant communities. So you see along the top of the picture, it's the trees are green, okay? And then below that, they're brown. But this is growing season, it's just that the drought was so severe that the trees growing on the limestone were so starved of water, their, they, their leaves shriveled up and died. And that's why it looks like fall, but it's not fall. Up higher, the leaves are green. And that's because they're on the Big Clifty Sandstone, which is a perched aquifer. And this affects plant uh, communities in the park as well, in the same way, because of that perched aquifer. 
So anyway, then now here's an interesting thing. We have uh, communities that uh, at least Randy Seymour decided, uh, uh, our botanist, uh, that wrote the book on wildflowers of Mammoth Cave National Park, uh, that on the south and west uh, facing limestone slopes, there's, um, it's, it gets very dry. It gets so dry that um, there's uh, limestone outcrops and you will actually have uh, prickly pear cactus. So the driest community in the park you'd think would be the one with the most fire dependency. Well, it's so dry, there's, there's just not enough fuel and productivity and not enough soil. And so there's rock outcrops and fire just doesn't carry. And also you see in the background of this picture, there's an Eastern red cedar. The Eastern red cedars are not fire adapted at all. They're easily killed by fire. And yet this is their habitat where they hold forth and they are not successional. Um, so very strange. Um, yeah, that you would have cactus in a place as, as uh, wet and humid as Kentucky is, uh, especially this year. Then here's a picture of the glades. And of course, because of that uh, droughty conditions, a lot of uh, deciduous trees are just killed off by the drought uh, conditions at times of the year. And that means that the canopy is pretty open, which actually supports uh, wildflowers like these fire pinks that you see here. But you'll see uh, a, a, a wide array of really beautiful wildflowers that are supported by that increased sunniness. And you can see the limestone outcrop, you know, behind the flowers there. Um, Really, really uh, interesting uh, community type. I think maybe my favorite in the whole park. What else we got here? Okay, I think that's for you, Kurt. Yes, it is. So uh, as Rick mentioned earlier, uh, ultimately the energy that gets into the cave ecosystem uh, that is the most important, um, as far as we know at this point, Anyway, he mentioned uh, chemosynthesis earlier, um, is, is ultimately uh, based on uh, photosynthesis. Um, however, uh, only a few of the animals that are act as conduits uh, for part of this energy that getting, getting it into uh, the cave ecosystem feed on that primary productivity, such as wood rats uh, eating nuts, or uh, cave crickets, you know, feeding on fruit. Um, most of this energy, most of the energy getting into the cave is derived from, uh, is, is detritus based, um, where, which is obviously a very reliable source of energy and uh, um, uh, th that primary productivity gets processed through um, in, into the detritus based uh, portion through uh, fungi and bacteria. Uh, with respect to the terrestrial cave ecosystem in the Mammoth Cave region, um, cave crickets are the largest and most reliable organism. Basically, you have an opening, there's going to be uh, some number, some density of cave crickets inside. And they're a keystone species because I, as I mentioned earlier, they bring nutrients from the surface uh, back into the cave in the form, they, they hang around most of the time and spend most of their time in the cave uh, they will go out onto the surface at night, um, feeding on, as I mentioned, uh, fungus and um, other and detritus, uh, in addition to fruits um, and carrion, and they're they're quite omnivorous. Uh, so they transfer, they act as a condu conduit uh, for uh, organic matter from the surface into the cave entrance in the form of guano and eggs and uh, uh, corpses also. Uh, cave crickets can also be uh, highly cannibalistic. As we can see here, juvenile feeding on a, uh, uh, an adult's drum, uh, um, a hind femur uh, that was dropped. On their way to the surface and back, uh, cave crickets run a gauntlet of predators that are typically found uh, around cave entrances. 
and that includes white-footed mice. There's research showing that their densities are higher around cave entrances, including in my own uh, dissertation. Uh, they feed on cave crickets. Cave salamanders are also cave cricket predators. Uh, and as we saw earlier, I didn't identify this. This is an orb-weaving spider, spider metaovalus. And here's something fun. We've gone back and forth. Um, could this marshmallow fungus, Bovaria uh, amorpha, it, well, I've included it in the predator section because it does um, attack and kill and consume cave crickets. Uh, it's not your the typical way you think of a predator, like a cheetah or a white-footed mouse, where it's active, but it does. It is an entomopathic. Uh, does feed on uh, insects, in, including cave crickets. So I mentioned earlier that uh, cave crickets support one community with their guano. Um, I mentioned that. They uh, spend most of their time on the ceiling digesting the food that they've uh, formed on the surface um, every 10 to 20 days. And they go back inside the entrances and they tend to be within about uh, 100 meters of, of any one cave entrance. Um, and they roost in large clusters, large and small clusters. They digest their food and they deposit guano on the formations below. And the guano forms uh, uh, different uh, densities uh, which supports different organisms. These arrows indicate that the animals are consuming what's uh, at the end of the arrow. So this uh, guano is directly uh, fed on by some organisms in addition to the fungus that grows on the guano, such as uh, mites and springtails and millipedes and the snail that I, uh, that I showed on the main slide there. We'll go back to that in a moment. These animals then are also consumed by large carabid beetles, um, smaller ones, as well as predatory mites and other beetles, uh, in addition to predatory um, fungus gnat larvae. Uh, and then, as I mentioned uh, earlier, they cave crickets are also preyed upon by um, several organisms around the entrances. Here is the snail I mentioned earlier. And then again, sp springtails feed on the guano, as well as the fungus growing on the guano. Then there are predators such as these uh, cave pseudoscorpions and cave harvestmen. And I'll mention that one, it, despite the fact that we're not able to be in the cave uh, experiencing that habitat, um, in, in all likelihood, we would not be seeing some of these animals. So in, in one way, it's a good thing because we have these wonderful pictures uh, taken by all three of your hosts. The second community is based on cave cricket eggs. Uh, they lay their eggs in the cave soil and the juveniles hatch out of the eggs. Both the eggs and the juveniles are preyed on by the large carabid beetle, large uh, being in quotes, they're about um, five to seven uh, millimeters long. Um, the carabid beetles feed on both the cave crickets and uh, juveniles and the eggs, uh, and they deposit their feces in the cave which is in turn fed on by a suite of organisms and those organisms have their predators as well. Um, there's a, a lovely image of a cave, cave beetle uh, stealing a cave cricket egg running off with it. And this is a cave millipede that feeds on the guano. And a primitive uh, insect bristle tail, also a feeds on uh, the uh, egg predator beetle guano, and then a predatory mite that eats uh, the guano feeders. And a bonus springtail. Yes, and a bonus springtail uh, whose name we could not remember. Uh, now, I, I mentioned that, that cave crickets um, are the largest, most reliably found organism throughout the Mammoth Cave area. Uh, but there, but uh, there are other organisms that still, large organisms that still play, have a role to play in the uh, support of cave communities, and that includes bats and wood rats. And uh, Rick Toomey will, is going to uh, start from here. Oh, okay. Um, 
as we noted, some of uh, various mammals uh, take are important in the uh, in the in the cave ecology. This is a wood rat here in its nice little nest. You can, and it's got fresh green uh, uh, vegetation that it has pulled in. It will be eat some of that vegetation. The nest is made from uh, bark of juniper trees, um, which just like putting it in your cedar trunk to keep your clothes uh, from being eaten by moths, it, this may reduce the number of fleas and other types of uh, parasites for the, for the wood rat. They may be selecting the cedar bark for specifically that reason. For those of you who do manage, who deal with show caves, uh, they, we, we found they also will go into the electrical wire, strip the uh, fiberglass uh, uh, coating out of the wires, uh, out of the, the electrical wire, and make nests out of uh, fiberglass from electrical wires as well. It's a, it really annoys the facilities people who have to deal with them chewing on the wires. They also cre create latrines, places where they uh, deposit their feces. Those feces feed a large number of different types of, um, uh, of invertebrates. There are uh, pseudoscorpions that we find typically associated with the uh, wood rat areas. Also uh, beetles like this Tomophagus, a uh, little scavenger beetle that's nearly eyeless, but it does have very small reduced eyes. Uh, fungus gnat larvae occur in these areas. These rats are bringing in a variety of um, organic matter and that organic matter decays and has fungus on it. So there's all sorts of things utilizing that fungus. Um, then in addition to the, the wood rats, we have here at Mammoth Cave, we have 13 species of bats, but eight of them regularly use the cave. And these include the Indiana bat, like you're seeing here, from Long Cave. These are a federally endangered species. They regularly roost in caves, in the caves. And our historic accounts and our paleontological uh, uh, research have shown that up to maybe a, less than a hundred years ago, there were millions of bats utilizing Mammoth Cave. Uh, these included many Indiana bats, little brown bats, gray bats, tricolored bats, a whole host of different ones. Unfortunately, modifications and human use of the cave, including saltpeter mining and tourism, probably led to very significant declines in the utilization of the cave by these bats. It also led to a large decrease in the amount of guano. It's possible that a hundred years ago, years ago that that the bats were, bats were the most significant piece of uh, source of the um, organic matter into the cave for the terrestrial ecosystem. However, now they've been they've been overtaken by probably by the cave crickets as the crucial. Uh, piece. And these bats, they deposit the guano, they also uh, occasionally die in the cave and are left behind as, uh, as, their own, as food source. This is ultimate recycling. Uh, the, the, we have a, the, those egg predator uh, beetles and uh, juvenile crickets. They're eating the bat. So the bat goes out and eats insects and now the insects are getting uh, their revenge. <laughs> I, I have a little uh, addition here, Rick, about bats. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm reading about Carlsbad Caverns and uh, there's a species of bat in there that they find mummified, and this bat 
just goes through the cave and just can't find its way out. Any guesses, uh, Rick, to me as to which species of bat that is? I have to go with a red bat. Yes, yes, red bats. They have them too. They come into Mammoth Cave and they just can't find their way out. Just amazing that, uh, you know, so far away, same species and same behavior, unfortunately for them. And I wanted to point out uh, just this one individual bit of guano. Look at that wonderful fungus that it's supporting. Uh, this is, a, as Rick said, this is uh, when, when bat numbers were larger, th these, this guano probably was the main source of input from the service, uh, surface um, uh, to supporting uh, cave invertebrate communities. So from here, uh, as we can see, um, uh, there are corpses from terrestrial, uh, the terrestrial cave uh, community organisms um, can, can be brought into uh, the cave aquatic ecosystem. Uh, we, we don't necessarily see it as, uh, 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 it's not readily apparent, but it obviously is, as we've seen in many of these others' wonderful presentations, uh, intimately connect, connected with the surface. As a matter of fact, what it is, it, it's, it's really a continuum of water that starts at the surface habitat, uh, flows through, the water flows through epicarst. Uh, sinking streams as well as vertical shafts. Um, and if you remember from earlier, uh, the way we were describing it at, as uh, uh, this dissolved organic matter and, and fine particulate organic matter being filtered through, uh, filtered through the epicarst, uh, ending up in temporary pools and streams, or in some cases in vertical shafts, uh, directly being brought down to uh, the base level streams. Uh, and then uh, these temporary pools and streams are also filtered down to permanent pools and streams, which eventually reach uh, base level streams. And base level streams can also flood and create these uh, 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 temporary pools in, in addition to uh, um, um, feeding te permanent pools and streams. Um, and then of course the base level streams are connected to the cave springs, which end up in the master uh, stream for the region, the Green River. And then as you can see here, uh, the Green River often back floods through Cave Springs, uh, bringing with it lots of dissolved organic matter and fine particular organic matter, and of course particular organic matter, and also um, uh, plenty of live organisms as well. And also unfortunately uh, pollutants, any pollutants that are in, in the river at that point. So, at the karst, uh, as you saw in the diagram, this is the highly weathered limestone and soil just beneath the surface in the region. Uh, water flows both vertically and horizontally through it. And this is illustrated nicely in this picture of a road cut in the winter time. You can see that the water is flowing straight th from this uh, and dripping as icicles um, through the epicarst. And these indeed are their own habitat uh, not as well known as the habitats that we have better access to. But we do know uh, that they support uh, cave adapted flatworms. Uh, the, the epicarst ha has this large water volume of water that supplies uh, cave pools and shaft drains. Uh, cave pools can be drip pools, which is another way that we find uh, out how some of these organisms that uh, make their that whose habitat is in the epicarst, uh, like amphipods. Um, flood pools can also uh, trap uh, stream-dwelling organisms, like um, uh, that are found in in the perch streams as well as in at base level, uh, such as um, this is a, a, a base level dwelling uh, cave fish, one of the top predators, the northern cave fish. Um, one uh, organism which is uh, also w w which is an omnivore and but is found can be found in uh, both high perched cave pools as well as uh, in the base level is the cave crayfish. They are not, as this picture shows, um, necessarily uh, entirely dependent on the, the standing water. They can move among cave pools and cave streams uh, 
as long as their gills stay wet, um, and regardless of, of where they are located, uh, these, these cave pools uh, can be an important habitat for cave aquatic organisms. Uh, sinking streams, that the, these, are, these drain stormwater directly into the cave. Uh, this is... The maelstrom. Maelstrom, yes. And uh, we can see uh, Ellie Winkler here ascending the maelstrom. Um, at the bottom of these, uh, these vertical shafts, we can find a, a, a splash pools. And then we start to see uh, more uh, cave adapted organisms in them, such as uh, these isopods, uh, the Cicadodia species. Um, and they will feed on dissol dissolved organic matter. In addition to, uh, I'll, I'll make a call back to uh, the um, individual uh, piece of guano we saw earlier from bats. I've seen them feeding directly on bat guano that had been deposited in, in cave pools. Uh, and so we're seeing more, uh, we're seeing more uh, uh, cave specialists uh, rather than epicar specialists at this point. And then uh, shaft drains and, and overflowing drip pools, uh, as well as the water flowing uh, through the epicarst, collect to form these permanent flowing streams that are perched above the water table. Um, again, we find the uh, ubiquitous throughout the cave aquatic habitat. We find the cave crayfish, Orconectes pellucidus. This is the same beastie we saw earlier walking uh, on dry land, dry in quotes. Um, but you'll note here, this individual is carrying some eggs under its tail. That's known as uh, being in berry. Um, here is in, in, in these perch streams, we find uh, the southern cave fish. Um, and this is a, a species separate from the northern cave, cave uh, fish. This is found in both these perch streams as well as in base level. So we have two top predatory fish uh, found in the Mammoth Cave area. So um, as, as you remember from the diagram, ultimately all the water moving through these habitats reaches the base level stream. Um, and this is where um, we find, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the northern cave fish. Um, and this is where you're going to find, uh, in, in most cases, away from the spring outlets, you're going to find the highly adapted cave organisms because um, the amount of energy available in these habitats is, is quite low. Um, and that also, we, we also find uh, the Kentucky cave shrimp, which is found uh, not only within, uh, largely within the Mammoth Cave boundaries, but it has also uh, been found in um, drainages uh, just outside, but it, uh, contiguous with, uh, with the drainages in the park. Uh, and this is a, um, a federally listed endangered species. Uh, and then, um, if you remember from the diagram, ultimately the water ends up in the master stream for the region, uh, the Green River. Um, and then from here, I'm going to turn it back over to Rick Olson. Okay. So we're going to talk next about ecosystem management challenges. Can we move ahead on that? Well, we might want to note so <laughs> oh, I'll, oh, I'll, you want I will retake I will retake over and we may want to note so here uh, this is this is an image this is a picture of Echo River Spring and you've seen uh, you've probably seen many images of that over the course of the presentations uh, you can see here that I if I'm not mistaken this picture was taken during a back flooding situation and you can see the particulate organic matter uh, around the entrance and this during the back flooding situations, this gets, uh, uh, and reverse flow situations, this uh, particular organic matter along with other organisms, sediment and pollution gets flushed back into the cave, which similar to when you have the influx of nutrients brought in by cave crickets or wood rats or bats in the cave aquatic ecosystem, this is where you're going to find a higher amount of diversity nearer these uh, spring heads near is a relative term, of course, um, but because of the influx of organisms from uh, the surface. And in fact, uh, some are, are can pass their life cycles, such as midges, uh, appear to be able to pass through their life cycle uh, in inside the cave stream. 
So from here, then, then we'll talk about the ecosystem management challenges uh, related to uh, the Green River, a, a, as well as uh, the, the Mammoth Cave area. Yeah, uh, Rick Olson here. Um, let me add to that um, there was a graduate student from uh, Western Kentucky University who studied uh, the prevalence of surface larval fish in base level areas of Mammoth Cave, like in River Styx and so forth. And uh, I think his name was, was it Mark Rule, R-U-H-L, to me? That's correct. Okay, okay, thanks, Kurt. Anyway, uh, they put in, you know, like fish traps, lighted fish traps, and oh my God, there were all these uh, tiny fish, surface fish. We had seen a lot of surface fish in places like River Styx before, but we had no idea how many of them there might be. And so that that highlights one of the, 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 the great partnerships between Western Kentucky University and Mammoth Cave National Park. We know a lot more about Mammoth Cave ecosystems because of that. And then uh, what was Compson's first name? Was it Zach? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, yes, yeah, Zach. He was also a guide, student at Western, and he did uh, carbon and nitrogen uh, isotope research uh, on Mammoth Cave uh, streams and found that, uh, what, which is being discovered other places, that the uh, aquatic cave life is dependent upon microbes that colonize the walls and those are fed by dissolved organic matter. And so th this is some really great research and partnership between the park and Western Kentucky University. And this, this what I'm saying is totally unplanned. We didn't even talk about this. So anyway, uh, so now we're gonna- No, it's, it, it, it's fine, you, you, you know, yet again, we're, de we're demonstrating that uh, the community, the cave aquatic community is, is a detritus-based community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now we should talk about ecosystem management challenges. Yes. Okay. So if you'll scroll up a little bit, we see a dump. Well, like Kurt was saying, you know, the primary productivity of the forest and grasslands uh, after it, it becomes part of the detritus layer on the forest floor or the prairie floor and water percolates through it, that, that provides energy into the, especially the cave aquatic ecosystem, but even also uh, supports uh, to a degree the terrestrial cave community. Well, in similar fashion, we have lots and lots of sinkhole dumps that harken back, especially to the day when there was no trash pickup. So everybody had a dump and a sinkhole is a perfect place to put it. So the water percolates through this and whatever kind of toxic stuff is in there winds up going down into the karst aquifer affecting both aquatic and terrestrial cave ecosystems. So we've been working on cleaning up dumps since, oh gosh, you know, back in the 90s, uh, a little program called Don't Mess With Mammoth Days. And with volunteers and so forth and park staff, here you see uh, one uh, led by uh, Brenda Padilla, our volunteer coordinator, and uh, tremendous amounts of trash and recyclables. And we've been cleaning up these dumps for years and uh, often with the support of volunteers. Um, including National Speleological Society, Cave Research Foundation, and so forth. And so that's just one thing where we're working on cleaning up dumps and uh, cleaning up uh, sources of uh, pollution in, in the, on the karst landscape. Now, uh, Rick Toomey, do you want to talk about sewers and storm runoff filters? Sure, why not? Okay, let's, sure. Let's, let's, let's start. As we've seen, the, the dumps are a relatively local way of, uh, of working on protecting water quality. It can be done at a regional scale in terms of trying to keep people from, uh, from, from uh, filling sinkholes with, with it, but each individual dump is a, 
local effort in their cleanup. However, as we said, much of the water comes from outside of the park and from a regional area. So some water quality issues require a more regional approach. And one of those is septic systems. In the, back in the 1960s and 1970s, Horse Cave, Cave City, Park City, and the park each had their own, actually I believe Horse Cave, Cave City, and the park each had their own failing uh, septic systems. I believe Park City just had uh, individual um, septic tanks. Had, had it, and unfortunately, all of these failing, either non-existent or failing uh, septic systems led to significant amounts of groundwater pollution. Well, large amounts of dye tracing by Jim Quinlan uh, and others showed that where all this pollution was going into all of these cave systems and led to a regional approach where the cities of Horse Cave, Cave City, Park City, the counties in the, in the area and the park all got together and got funding for developing a regional sewer system to allow better protection of the thing, uh, of the groundwater. Indeed, this is an older picture of that. Portions of that sewer system now extend out toward Brownsville as well and further out toward Glasgow. They're, they've expanded this even more to bring more of the karst areas into uh, into a centralized sewer system rather than individual septic systems. Unfortunately, away from those towns, we still have a lot of individual septic, but at least in the concentrations of people, we are developing, we've got a uh, more centralized system, better maintained, and allowing better protection of the karst. On park, we continue to have local potential issues. For instance, we're bringing hundreds of thousands of visitors a year into the park. Most of them are driving in cars or, or, or vans or occasionally buses that park in the parking lots. And so our parking lots can develop oil and other things from uh, uh, on the surface that would potentially run off into the cave. So we have developed a set of uh, stormwater runoff filters. We have nine of these on park for different, um, uh, for different parking areas. We have two stage filters. They go through an oil and grit separator to remove most many of the hydrocarbons and much of the silt. Following the oil and grit separator, they go into a canister filter set. That's what you're seeing here. This is a uh, effort where they are replacing the canisters. We replace them every three years. The canisters have a uh, perlite, zeolite, and activated charcoal uh, mix in them. The target is to get rid of uh, heavy metals. It also does a good job of, of getting the, the uh, hydrocarbons that wander through the oil and grit separator. If you try to do a die trace, you need to do the die trace from the uh, bottom end of the parking lot filters because they also do a really nice job of, of catching the die um, and removing the die from the system. Uh, so these parking lot filters are a local way so we can protect the groundwater quality uh, for, at, at the park. Say, so, Rick, I got a question here. After sure. three years, what do you do with these canisters? You throw them in a sinkhole? Yes. 
<laughs> no. uh, well, actually, I I can't fully answer that. We contract essentially. We contract, and each time we've contracted with the same people who do our our, our centralized sewer system. Caveland Environmental comes, changes out the the old filters, and then disposes of the material from the from or disposes of the the fil material from the old filters, presumably in a legal appropriate landfill. Yeah. Um, and uh, puts in the new filters. Okay. <laughs> I just don't want to see him in a sinkhole dump, okay? That's all. No. <laughs> okay, who's going to talk about Lock and Dam 6? Uh, I believe you were. That? You want me to do that? Yes. Yes, I'll do that. All right. So this is Lock and Dam 6. Uh, after it failed uh, on Thanksgiving weekend of 2016. And of course, we had been plotting for years to find ways to blow this thing up, including using Miss Green River and uh, sort of like uh, the African Queen, you know, making torpedoes and then uh, shipping it downstream to blow up the dam. All sorts of campfire ideas that we had, uh, but it finally failed on its own. Um, and then in 2017, uh, guys with uh, brass whatevers uh, went out there with track hose and demolished this dam. And I'm telling you, it was scary. Uh, but they were, these are Fish and Wildlife Service guys, and they didn't care. They just went out there and tore out that dam because they want to get rid of the damn dam. Well, that was the single greatest uh, unresolved ecosystem management issue in the park for decades. And so, you know, they just took care of it. Well, people would call up my boss at the time, Bobby Carson, who was the chief of uh, science and resources and say, well, what about Echo River? What happened? Did it go back down to where it was? And, and, and Bobby asked me and I said, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, because the spring is full of gravel from an old road that went to the treatment plant uh, down in uh, the floodplain, which is part of what Rick Toomey was describing as part of the failed uh, sewer system back in the day. And I remember when I first started here in 93, that thing was still in operation. Well, water, you know, we get these torrential rainfalls, the gravel would wash down the road and into the spring. And of course, what they do, they put on more gravel on the road. This happened over and over and over for decades. So there's literally tons and tons and tons of road gravel in Echo River Spring. And it dammed it up. And this picture you see here is one of our uh, National Speleological Society volunteers. And so for three summers, uh, you know, they have a week-long expedition and we have dug up, bagged up, and ziplined out road gravel. And you see there's still a lot there. Um, and so as a result of that, we've been able to actually lower the uh, water level in Echo River in the cave by about 11 inches. It's getting closer to its historic level that it was pre-dam, but we still got a lot of work to do. Now, this is uh, uh, Brian, one of our volunteers, and he's holding my long bar. That long bar is six feet long, and it's down in the gravel. He could just, he found he could just wiggle it, and it would ride on down through the gravel, and he could just pull it right back up. Uh, rather shocking and astounding uh, that this could happen. So this is a project we continue to work on to get the underground rivers to function the way they did before Lock and Dam 6, before the sewage treatment facility and the floodplain, before all the road gravel and so forth. Uh, lots of job security here. So anyway, yeah. Now we can talk about cave access. Rick, you want to talk about gates? Yeah, yes, I am. I will note we are now running late, so we should keep things reasonably uh, short. But I will note one, obviously we have cave, many caves on the park and they have a variety of important um, 
uh, resources in them. We've seen some of the biological ones. They also have cultural resources, minerals, etc. And in order to protect some of those resources, especially in some of the more well-known caves that are easier to find, uh, we use gates in order to uh, protect the cave where possible. Uh, we use a bat-friendly gate uh, one that ha allows for uh, no reduced reduction or, or no reduction in airflow so that they remain neutral for airflow, uh, have nice large horizontal areas available for the bats to fly through. This one is interesting. You'll see this is at the main historic entrance. You'll notice it has a door and it needs that because 200,000 people a year go in and out that gate, and they're not very good at crawling through a removable bar, especially at 120 people per tour. So we have the, the we needed a door, but you'll notice the door is set parallel to the airflow in and out of the cave. So the door does not contribute to airflow reduction. Uh, so this is a, a nice, way of dealing with this. However, sometimes these uh, gates that allow a large amount of airflow will have uh, unforeseen consequences. Rick? Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief here. Didn't realize we were over uh, time, but you'll notice that you see the reflection on the lower part of the gate and, and uh, that's plexiglass to limit the airflow. The upper part of the gate is left open because that's the part that the bats pr prefer. Uh, we actually videotaped that for two hours with Kentucky uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife Resources and watched uh, the parts of the gate that the bats liked and, 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 and therefore left that open. So uh, the entrance passage, House and Snarrows, uh, was gradually uh, enlarged over the decades, many, many decades. And um, so, but the airflow was always limited by rock walls and doors and things like that. Well, then they put in an open grid gate and suddenly airflow was just amazing. And unfortunately, uh, in January of uh, 19... 96, I think. 94. Uh, what was that? 1994. 94, thank you. Um, it was extremely cold. Uh, and so the influx of cold air into the cave was astounding. And it caused a massive rock fall that you'll see here. About 40 tons of rock fell in a rotunda as a result of this. And in fact, uh, where the uh, guides would control the lighting for the saltpeter works, that was crushed. Some of the saltpeter works were crushed. Thankfully, this happened at night. No guides or visitors were uh, are under there, so far as we know. Um, also, this cold air went deep into the cave, like a mile and a half into the cave, and it chilled everything down. Well, when the weather changed and uh, it wasn't so cold, then the humidity uh, in the cave wound up condensing on organic archaeological remains. So let's see the cane torches here. This is from uh, Wright's Rotunda, a mile and a half in a cave. Uh, this piece of cane was stable for thousands of years, uh, left there by uh, Indian cavers. And uh, because we altered the airflow into the cave, it then, uh, well, thousands of these artifacts started growing mold. Um, we think that this is now stabilized again, and we are working very carefully to restore the cave atmosphere in the cave uh, and, and really, uh, yeah, so that we don't have these kind of consequences again. Okay, enough said on that. I will pick up, this is Rick Toomey again. Um, as we know, I mean, one of the greatest threats to ecosystems throughout the world are invasives, invasive plants, invasive animals, invasive pathogens, uh, as the, the, these have led to 
large scale degradation of large numbers of ecosystems around the world. And a very specific uh, example of this is an invasive fungus called uh, Pseudogymnoasis destructans. It is a fungus that was known in a large portion of Eurasia. Uh, unfortunately, around 2005, 2006, uh, it seems to have come, it came to North America, it was introduced in North America and has been spreading through North America since that time. It causes a disease in many species of bats called white nose syndrome. You can see the white fungus on the face, but also on the wings, often on the ears, the tail, that gives the, the but the white fungus on the nose and face gives it the name white nose syndrome. It causes mortality in a number of species of bats. At the park, we have at least four species that have been significantly impacted. Uh, the most impacted is the northern long-eared bat. Uh, this says oh, with over 95% of them uh, wiped out. Actually, it's probably closer to 99% wiped out. Uh, back in 2003-2004, Surveys suggested that the northern long-eared bat was probably the most common bat on park. And now they are, they, they are extirpated or extinct as a ecologically functioning species on park. There may be one or two on park, but they're not they, they don't have the ecological function that they once did. Uh, in addition, Indiana bats, little brown bats, and tricolored bats have all seen uh, reductions of over 80% from this. Researchers throughout the country and throughout uh, both throughout North America are working on uh, treatments and preventions. In the meantime, the park continues to try and help at least keep it from expanding further. We have visitors going into a cave that has white nose fungus uh, in it. So when they get out of the off of their tours, they walk over a mat with a cleaning solution to at least try and reduce the potential that they will uh, that that they will carry that fungus elsewhere and introduce it into another cave. Okay, so Rick Olson again. Uh, so one of the problems we have is yeah. misbehaviors on the parts of visitors. Uh, this is Sand Cave where some knuckleheads came in with spray paint and they spray painted this high temperature paint on the ceiling uh, on the sandstone. And these are volunteers with the National Speleological Society that I've mentioned before. And I, I just can't speak highly enough of these people. They come from uh, surrounding seven states and, and Brian that you saw at the spring, he flies in from Portland, Oregon. He's probably out there fighting for black lives right now instead of doing what we're do, doing in the cave here, but good for him. And uh, anyway, this high temperature paint would not respond to the usual methods of re graffiti removal. So they're using propane torches to burn it off. And um, it takes hours. I mean, you, you know, and, um, and we have all sorts of different kinds of graffiti scratched on, written on with Sharpie and I don't know, paint pens and you name it. And uh, so we have to develop techniques for each different kind of graffiti. Um, so, you know, with sandstone, we can get away with these torches. Uh, with limestone, you can't do that. It'll, it'll, it'll explode on you and all that. So, um, again, it's, it's one of our cave management issues that we work on. And without our volunteers, uh, we'd be dead in the water. So, uh, at this point, um, we've reached the end and uh, if you're interested, uh, looking for more information, you can always contact uh, one of us, uh, depending on your topic. Or we, um, uh, in addition, uh, one of the people 
that particularly with respect to bats and wood rats uh, that you can contact is uh, my supervisor, Steve Thomas. Um, this story map will be up. Uh, it will be uh, released through uh, Mammoth Cave social media and then will also eventually be posted on the Mammoth Cave website. Uh, you can also find more information um, about uh, the work that uh, the Cumberland Piedmont Network does in monitoring cave organisms by visiting uh, our website. And then, of course, uh, all credit to the people that took about these wonderful photos and gave us permission to uh, use them in this story map. Now, uh, we were since we are running long, I'll I'll uh, just tell you about this uh, video. This can also this is part of the story map, but it can also be found on the INM Network YouTube page. It's about eight minutes long, and it describes the monitoring efforts that the Cumberland Piedmont Network does on four cave organisms in Mam in the Mammoth Cave area, uh, such as bats, wood rats, cave crickets, and cave aquatic biota. Kurt? Um, yes. Don't forget the resources uh, on the, um, uh, the, the uh, Karst 2020. Uh, yes. So on all the topics that we've discussed during this presentation, uh, we have, I believe, 12 chapters uh, out of a book that was published in, I think, 2017, uh, The Mammoth Cave, A Human and a Natural History. And there are 12 chapters uh, based on everything with, that we've talked about except for cave graffiti removal. Um, but, and, and so if, if you want more information, include uh, the, all 12 of these chapters are posted on the uh, supplemental information link uh, to this, uh, to our field trip, our virtual field trip. Say, Kurt, did, did we not include environmental issues chapter? I, I believe we did, yeah. Yes, so we did. the cave graffiti's in there. Okay, graffiti's probably in there and, you know, the highway issues and the railroad and et cetera. And I'm just gonna say, uh, in there you'll see that I put in a plug for expansion of railroads because they're so much more efficient than trucks and so forth on the highway. We're not going to stop growing, so we've got to get more efficient. We've got to get safer, and railroads are better than highways and trucks. So that's one thing that I'm going to put in a plug for. Uh, it, I'll never see it in my life, but, you know, well, our first railroad was put in in 1859, and that's what we have today. Imagine if we had the same roads that we had in 1859. Sorry, that would be a sad situation. So we need to expand the railroads and reduce our uh, traffic on, on the highways by uh, trucks and so forth. So, and with that, given that we're over time, I'm gonna shut up. So I don't know if... Uh... Yeah, I'll jump in if, uh, if you guys are finished. Um, so thank you so much to our speakers. If you guys have any questions, um, you can go ahead and submit those via email. As they mentioned, all the resources are available um, both on the CARS 2020 website and will also be available um, on the NPS website. So be sure to check those out. Um, this represents the end of our sessions today. So um, we're gonna go ahead and sign off, but we encourage you to join us again tomorrow morning for the last day of the conference. We have um, our workshops um, going, those begin at 8 a.m. And so um, that will wrap us up and we look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you. Thanks to our speakers. You guys did a fantastic job. Oh, thank you. Over and out. Okay, bye-bye.